Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us online. My name is Happy and this is Nap, and we're pastors of Champion Life Center Guelph. Whenever you can, we would love for you to come and join us Sunday afternoons at 3.30. The address is 55 Devere Drive, Guelph, Ontario. I hope that you're ready for the word because here it comes. Wow, thank you, Jesus. Happy Palm Sunday. If you haven't guessed it, <laughs> we're celebrating Palm Sunday. And what a way to celebrate the start of what we, what the Christian world calls Holy Week. Uh, some call it the Passion Week. And I'm very, you know, I'm very privileged to be the one to speak today on Palm Sunday. And we're taking a break from the stewardship series and giving, um, a Palm Sunday message and preparing all of our hearts as we anticipate this coming week. And I pray that our hearts will be, will anticipate the coming days, the coming celebration of Easter and Good Friday with the right position in our hearts, that our hearts would be positioned correctly according to the will and the heart of God as we, you know, take the time that it's not just a nice long weekend we get to take off of work. It's not just a good break, but there is a deep uh, uh, meaning and significance, as we all know, with this coming week. And we are celebrating Palm Sunday. And I am just, aren't you blessed to be here today? Even our online family just worshiping the Lord on Palm Sunday. Amen. Praise the Lord. I don't know if I need to preach, but I will. <laughs> that was powerful. That I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but God was speaking a lot to me during worship. Amen. I, I hope you were receiving a lot from the Lord. Let's just pray. Thank you for your word today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for coming down. Thank you for leaving the comfort of heaven. Thank you for being courageous enough, Jesus. Thank you for your courage to embrace the suffering so that we can enjoy your presence today and we can be with you today. I pray, Father, that this will not just be another Palm Sunday message, but that, Father, you would use it to truly take our hearts into deeper depths of love with you. I thank you, Father. Let us be a people rooted and grounded in the love of our Father that is in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Today's message, I've entitled our, our Palm Sunday message, Consider These. Consider These. So we're going to uh, consider three things today, and I want us to open our Bibles or your Bible apps to Mark chapter 11 verses 1 to 11, and I'm reading from the New International Version. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, as they untied it, where am I now? Some people standing there asked, what are you doing and tying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw, when they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let me just say that. Those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom 
of our father David, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Amen. God bless the reading of this word. You know, the Christian tradition holds Palm Sunday as the opening to what uh, we all in a universal body of Christ celebrate as the Holy Week or the Passion Week. And it, start, uh, it starts off with this, uh, in this situation, this event where Jesus rides on a donkey on a colt um, entering Jerusalem. And I want to propose to you, family, that the picture of Jesus entering Jerusalem and what we all call the triumphal entry is really a scene of irony. It's a scene full of irony, full of paradox, because here he was, only Jesus knew what was coming. Everyone was excited with their own agenda. There were political activists in that time, in those days, who believed that it was time for the Roman Empire to be overthrown. Now they have heard for years the rabbi, the one who calls himself Messiah, has been doing so many miracles, opening blind eyes, making the lame walk, uh, feeding the multitudes with five with five fish and two loaves of bread and, 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 and stopping the storm. They've heard all the miracles, all the healings that Jesus uh, uh, had done. And the miracle prior to his entry to Jerusalem was Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. This was a bi- one of the biggest miracles because nobody had ever raised someone from the dead who has been dead for how many days? And here is Jesus. Everyone is so excited because of all the things that he has done. They're ready to make him king. Everyone, the political activists, his disciples, they all had different agenda, but Jesus was entering Jerusalem with a mission and only he knew what that mission would actually look like. There was a celebration while Jesus anticipated suffering. There was a celebration, a welcoming. Do you know that when they threw uh, cloaks on the road, and I'm, I think I'm going ahead of myself, but getting ahead of myself, but when they threw their clothes on the road to make way for him coming to Jerusalem, that it's a picture of a king returning from war, returning from a victorious war. And and they're celebrating because finally the promise of God, of the Messiah who would deliver them and put an end to all the foreign oppressors. And in their context, it was the Roman Empire. They believed that they were standing on a very historical, pivotal moment. That Jesus has come to finally put an end to the oppression by the Roman Empire and set them free and become the kingdom that God has promised them to be. Everyone had a different agenda. Jesus came in with a mission. And everyone had a picture of how the kingdom would look like, of of how the kingdom that was about to be established would look like. Only Jesus knew the price he had to pay. It's a picture of very, very sharp contrast celebration and anticipation of suffering an anticipation of a ruling king that would put an end to the roman oppression and an anticipation of dying a criminal's death it was a picture of a huge uh, set of contrasts and so today i want to invite all of us as we celebrate palm sunday to consider Three things as we reflect on the triumphal entry of our Lord. Number one, consider how God never forgets his promises and intentions. Hundreds and hundreds of years, God had prophesied, God had spoken through his prophets of different periods of time about his intention to establish an everlasting kingdom. Zechariah chapter 9 is a, is a promise of a coming king entering Jerusalem exactly the way Jesus did in the triumphal entry. Now, we're not going to go there, but Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 9 is a, is a prophecy about, look 
A king is coming to you, O Jerusalem. Shout with voices of triumph because he is coming, humble and gentle, riding on a colt. And he will put an end to all the foreign oppressors and crush your enemies. That is Zechariah chapter 9. So when everybody saw Jesus riding on a colt, they remembered the prophecy and believed that Jesus was coming to fulfill that prophecy. God never forgets his promise and intentions. You see, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, God was fulfilling his promise. But his fulfillment of his promise did not match the expectation of the people. He was entering as a triumphant king because he knew the final outcome. He was entering as that king who would put an end to all the enemies and crush the head of the serpent. God never forgets his promises and intentions. But let's backtrack a bit. You and I remember that from the very beginning in Genesis, God's intention was always to partner with man in governing his creation, his created order here on earth. How? Through an unbroken communion, 24-7 fellowship with him, wherein his spirit lives within man. That's why he breathed his spirit into Adam, and Adam became a living being. His spirit lived within Adam and Eve. His intention was to rule over the creation with man. How? Through a through an intimate fellowship that's unbroken, an intimate communion, a relationship with his sons and daughters. That has always been his intention. And from that intention, he makes his promises. Married couples, you know that when you intend to love your spouse, richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, you know that that's your intention, so you make your promises. God's promise was spoken to King David was related to his intention of dwelling among men and walking among men and living within men so that that unbroken fellowship and communion establishes his kingdom. His promise is directly related to his intention. Repeat that with me. His promise is always directly related to his intention. 2 Samuel 7, verse 16, he said to King David, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And we all know that Jesus is is a descendant of King David. And, and so this was a promise. Everybody in that triumphal entry who were waving their palms to, to celebrate the coming king knew that prophecy. See, why? Because, I'm going to backtrack a bit. Remember, his promise is related to his intention. His intention was to build an everlasting kingdom. His intention was to have you and me live in eternity with him. So he makes these promises. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. This is decades and decades, centuries after King David lived. God repeats his promise, and his promise revealed that he intends to establish an eternal kingdom. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this, will perform this. And now in Mark 11, we see Jesus having already been in ministry for three years, having performed many miracles, healing signs and wonders. People started following him. People started believing in him. There was momentum going on. It would have been so easy to interpret that momentum as ministry success. It would have been so easy to let the cheering crowd make Jesus the ruling king at that moment. But Jesus knew that although the multitudes were now starting to embrace him as their king, he knew that their understanding of his kingdom was not aligned to God's intention. 
Again, promises reveal intention. Intention clarifies the purpose of promise. And, and I want you to follow this church because when we consider these things, we will be able to be, remain confident no matter what happens. God's promise, God intended to establish his dominion upon the earth through unbroken communion and fellowship and intimacy between us and him. And so God's promise was not just to give us a righteous and just king. His promise was to give us a king who rules forever and us forever with him. So it's not just a king who fights for us. It's a king who loves to dwell with us and dwell with us forever in an, eternal in an eternal kingdom. God's eternal rule was to be first sown in the hearts of men. His eternal kingdom was first to be sown and planted in the hearts of men, not on the throne in Jerusalem after triumphal entry. He intended that his kingdom would not remain on a temporal uh, location on a temporal throne that can be destroyed by human hands. He intended that his rule and reign would be established in the hearts of men where the hearts of men can go into eternity because he who is the eternal one dwells within us. That's his intention. If he had become king that time, we would not be able to live eternal life. God's eternal rule was to be sown first in our in the hearts because the Bible says in Ecclesiastes that he has set eternity in our hearts. Christ's suffering was therefore imperative. It was therefore required so that his suffering would cleanse our hearts so that our broken fellow fellowship with the Father is restored so that his kingdom can be once again established in us and around us. That was God's intention. That was the context of his promise. And that remains to be the context of every promise he has given you and he has given me. He wants to provide for your needs. Why? Because his, your provision is a manifestation of his kingdom residing in you. And when provision manifests to those who are lacking, his kingdom is manifested. His promise reveals his intention. We needed to be cleaned up before he can dwell in us again. And if Jesus allowed himself to be, to be crowned king after he entered Jerusalem, there would have been no way for our hearts to be cleaned. There would, be, there would have been no way for him to dwell in us. Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove you, your heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will, speaks of intention, I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. He's saying, I will change you your heart. I will give you a new heart. Why? Because only then when you carry a new heart that reflects my heart can we move in unity, in intimacy, in close fellowship without any barrier. He loves us so much that he was not content be an external king he wanted closest proximity with us he wanted to be inside of us that is the intention of our father ha ah. oh my lord I pray today that we would realize that every promise God has made in our life is tied to that intention God promised more than just setting us free from the, from the demons, from, the, from demonic oppression. God 
promise forgiveness, not just so we can feel good, but because in forgiveness we can walk without guilt and shame and walk openly with our Father in heaven. Because that was his intention. He promised transformation of hearts. Jeremiah 31, 33. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions. I will put my instructions deep within them. And I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God. And they will be my people. That is a picture of the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts. You know, uh, maybe some of you have seen it today. We launched a campaign, a countdown to Easter Sunday, and we were so blessed with Briner allowing him his testimony to be shared. Hallelujah. And you're going to see more um, surprises to, uh, in the next every day throughout this week until Easter Sunday. And when you read their testimonies, you're going to see that God is not just, God is not just, interested in lifting up our burden he's interested in changing our hearts because if our burdens are lifted but our hearts remain unchanged the burdens will come back and find room for it the the burdens will come back and oppress us again if our hearts remain unchanged you can receive a miracle but if your heart is unchanged you can easily fall back into the pit God does not just intend to answer our prayers for answering our prayers' sake. He intends to answer our prayers so that our relationship can move forward and can move into deeper depths. And so that out of that relationship, the kingdom of God manifests wherever you go, wherever we go. The triumphal entry is a reminder that yes, God may answer our prayers for provision, for deliverance, for healing, for miracles, but his intention never changes and his intention is always to establish his kingdom on the basis of love his promise to transform our hearts is to transform our hearts to become like him and that is why family it's important jesus commanded us seek first his kingdom not even his promises because if we seek his promise and not his intention we will have a distorted interpretation of moments when he does not answer our prayers. Don't mistake our answered prayers to be the finish line and fulfillment of God's plan. I'm going to repeat that. Don't mistake answered prayers to be the finish line and ultimate fulfillment of God's plan. If our prayers are not being answered, it does not mean to say that God's plan is not being fulfilled. If our understanding of God's promises is limited to an answered prayer, then my friend, we are missing the point because God never forgets his promise. God never forgets his intentions. The people who cried out Hosanna were shocked that the following days after he was charged with a crime he never committed. And in those events, in that week, a lot of confused people, a lot of people misunderstand. Why? Because they did not understand his intention. They only focused on the promises spoken by the prophets. God never forgets his promise. It may look like he's not answering our prayers, but he has not forgotten his promise. He has not forgotten his intention. God intends to establish his eternal kingdom starting in our hearts, and one day he will fully establish it on earth because as you know that although the people were crying out Hosanna one day and crucify him the next day, it never changed God's plan to redeem every single one, whether they cried Hosanna or crucify him, he went and paid the price for their redemption. God never forgets his promise. Do not lose sight of God's intentions when you stand on his promises. Don't lose sight because if the promises don't look like they are coming to pass, focus on his intention because he is a God who never forgets his intentions. His promises are tied to his intentions. When we consider that God never forgets his promises and intentions, we can remain confident even when our desires are not fulfilled 
or our expectations are not met or when we face trials. Let it be this Palm Sunday. Let it be our declaration. God, you never forget your promise. And however it looks like now, you will use it to fulfill your promise. Joseph was thrown in the pit after God showed him his destiny. And for 13 years, Joseph worked as a slave after God showed him that he was going to rule. He worked as a slave. He was treated as a prisoner. It didn't matter. God did not forget his promise. God never forgets his promise. And let our declar- so let our declaration today be, Lord, no matter how it looks like now, I know you will use it to fulfill your promise. Amen? Number two, consider our need for a Savior King. Number one, consider that God never forgets his promises and intentions. Number two, consider our need for a Savior King. People were crying out, Hosanna! We sing it here, Hosanna! Hosanna! (laughs) That was my falsetto uh, voice. (laughs) Hosanna is not just a praise. The original meaning of Hosanna is save us now. Deliver us now. So when next time we sing, Hosanna, that's what it means. <laughs> Lord, you are king, so save us now. That's what it means. The people recognized their need for a Messiah king because they were oppressed by the Romans. They failed, however, to grasp that their need for him went further than that. Their cry and praise for deliverance was genuine but shallow. Their understanding of the Messiah was true, but insufficient. They only saw the healings and miracles, but did not perceive the truths he was trying to teach them through his words. They cried out, save now, deliver now, but only envisioned a king with endless miracles and healings to give out, not a king who would deal with the tyranny of sin and death. They only saw the Roman oppressors as their enemy and failed to see sin and pride and death as the ultimate oppressors and tyrants. Hosanna, save us now. Rule over us now. See, family, if you didn't know it, I got news for you. You and I need a savior king. We need a savior king. To those of you joining us online, We need a Savior King. The thought that we can live without anyone ruling over us. We don't need a a Savior servant. We need a Savior King. One who rules over us. We need a Savior King. The thought that we can live without anyone ruling over us is unrealistic at best and erroneous at worst. When we choose to be our own rulers... We make ourselves slaves to our own self-centered ambitions and desires, enslaved to our insecurities and sins. When we make ourselves the captain of our own souls, the master of our own fate, we become servants to short-sighted vision, to distorted interpretation of events. We need a savior king. We were designed, family, to be ruled by a loving, humble, and righteous, holy king. That's why when we surrender our lives to the lordship of Jesus, as many of you know this because you have surrendered your life, I hope, and if you have not, please surrender your lives to Jesus. 
When we surrender our lives to Jesus as our Lord, not just as our Savior, you and I realize that when we do so, we flourish even though the conditions around us or in us are not perfect. There is a peace that money cannot buy. There is a joy that no amount of wealth can purchase. There is, there is that sense of fulfillment, that sense that I have come home because love is where we belong. And God, who is king, is God, who is love. We need a savior king. The peace that Jesus gives, we cannot manufacture on our own. No promotion in any of our jobs can bring in that peace. <clears throat> Anna, sorry, can you pass me my, my water, please? Thank you. <clears throat> We belong to that place of being ruled by a loving king. Wives, we all know that. When our husbands love us, it's so easy to submit. <laughs> when we, we thrive, you know, the wives that are, look blooming are the wives that are being loved. The, 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 the husbands that are growing are husbands that are loved. <laughs> we thrive in the presence of love. Our children thrive in the presence of love. We thrive in a way that education, education or, or career cannot cause us to thrive. We thrive. There is a thriving that comes that, that, that is birthed in the presence of true Love, no matter how cringy that sounds like. We need a Savior King. And the good news is that God knew our need. And He knew exactly what He needed. And like what PJ said the other Sunday, He may not give us everything we want, but He gives us whatever we need. And He knew we needed a Savior King. The Bible says, no one is righteous, not even one. Our righteousness are like filthy rags. We cannot be, we are not qualified to be our own Savior King. Our, our parents, doesn't matter if your dad is Bill Gates, he cannot be Savior King. He's here today and could be gone anytime. God forbid. Save him first, Jesus if he's not yet saved. So number two, consider our need for Savior King. Number one, consider that God never forgets his promises and intentions. Lastly, consider how Jesus embraced his coming suffering. Consider the example Jesus shows us. First of all, Jesus enters Jerusalem riding on a colt, and that's significant. See, nothing is an accident. No, no, there's nothing that's a coincidence or an accident. In, when we read scriptures, everything that Jesus did was really for a purpose. You see, in their time, whenever a king won a battle, and if he won a battle against a certain city, he would enter that city that, whose king he had overcome, take ownership of that city. And when he does that, he rides on a horse. Any king that would enter a city riding a horse meant that I am victorious and I will crush all my enemies that will resist me. That, that is why it was significant that God specified through the prophet Zechariah, saying, look, here is your king. He is riding on a colt, on a donkey, humble and gentle, telling us that Jesus was going to defeat the enemy, not with brute or force, but with his humility and gentleness demonstrated on the cross. That is the example that Jesus was showing us. 
And so many times the enemies that we face, the enemy in our relationships, and I'm not talking about your husband or your wife. <laughs> the, the enemy which is pride, the enemy which is uh, 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 selfishness, the enemy of, of lust, the enemy. Do you know that the only way we defeat that is to come in humility, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up. He will exalt you above your enemies. That is why Paul the Apostle says that I, I, we will crush the enemy's head like Jesus did. How? Not through brute or force, but through humility and gentleness. Jesus entered Jerusalem to put a final defeat on the enemy called sin and death. And he did not do it with a miracle or his power, a demonstration of his power. He did it by dying a criminal's death. See, he was coming as a king, no doubt about it. In 2 Kings chapter 9, we're not going there, but in 2 Kings chapter 9, when you go home, you can read about it. Jehu was crowned king, and the picture in Je and when Jehu entered as king, everyone laid their clothes on the road, like their red carpet. They didn't have red carpet, so they just put their clothes. So because CLC, we don't have red carpet in our events, we'll just put our clothes. It's biblical. I remember when we had our New Year's Eve and tried to come up with a red carpet. Got an idea now. Jesus knew that his entry to Jerusalem would get the ball rolling for his sufferings. He knew it. And yet he entered boldly in a triumphant entry because he already knew the outcome. He knew he was about to suffer. In fact, his disciples warned him not to enter Jerusalem because he might get a lot. There were already plots going around to arrest Jesus. And his disciples warned him. But he entered, and he entered publicly. He entered with, with, with triumph. He entered as a triumphant king, knowing he was about to face his sufferings because he already knew the outcome. Hebrews 12 verse 2 tells us, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, that we ought to fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus rode on a donkey in a triumphant entry, knowing he was about to suffer in the hands of men. Why? Because of the joy set before him. He knew that his sufferings were not eternal. There was a joy at the end of the sufferings. And what was the joy set before him? It's seeing you coming home to the Father. It's seeing your children come to know that they are loved and not abandoned. They are not orphans, but they are children of God. It's seeing your co-worker know the pleasure of Christ's forgiveness because of your testimony. He saw the joy set before him. He saw Amy. He saw Irma. He saw joy set before him. Joy what he what? <laughs> you and I were the joy set before Jesus that caused him to enter Jerusalem without fear of the sufferings he was about to embrace. Ha! Ah, caused him to endure the cross. Now, what if he was setting an example for us, family, so that the next time we're going through a really rough time as children of God, we remember that there, too, is a joy set before us. We set our eyes on Jesus so that we can see the joy that Jesus saw when he endured the cross. The joy set before him is the joy set before you. The joy set before you and me is our neighbor coming to the Lord, our co-worker hearing the gospel for the first time, 
our child deciding to commit her life to Jesus, your spouse loving like Jesus and talking like him and walking in humility, no longer in pride. That is the joy set before you so you and I can endure the cross. We embrace what Jesus demonstrated for us to follow. Consider how Jesus embraced his suffering Jesus enters Jerusalem in a triumphal entry, knowing that he's about to face what he's about to face, a disciple betraying him, his most trusted friend denying him, his disciples abandoning him. He, was fa- he knew he was going to face a lot of whipping, a lot of flogging, scourging, mocking, getting spat at, the crown of thorns, the nails, the heavy cross he had to carry for one and a half mile while suffering from his bleeding because of the scourging. He knew what he was about to face, and yet he faced it with triumph because he knew the final outcome was victory. What if, family, because you and I have become children of God, what if we remember that the final outcome is always victory? What if in everything we go through, we remember the final outcome is always victory. He was a, Jesus was able to embrace what was about to happen with an attitude that was not based on his circumstance, but based on the outcome that he knew was going to come. Can we follow Christ this way? Paul the Apostle told the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 2.14, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. My, my, um, I want you to know, church, today that you might be heading into some sufferings or difficulties. You might be in the middle of it right now, but as long as you and I are being led by Christ, we are being led into triumphant procession. The road might be rough, the trials might be hotter and hotter, but you are on a triumphant procession based on the Word of God. You and I can enter any trial we can that's God-ordained and and stand as confident as Jesus was. Even though you know you're about to suffer, you remain confident like Jesus was. Not only that, every step we take as Christ leads us into triumphant procession diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge every place your footstep goes. I don't know about you, but, and I'm almost done, I'm into essential oils. (laughs) I love essential oils. Um, And I love the diffusers that diffuse the oil. And in fact, I have friends, high school friends, we still are always in communication and we talk about what oil they like and what <laughs> oil I like. And we talk about how these oils actually help, you know, refre- feel, make you feel refreshed and renewed. And I'm not trying to sell you any essential oil, I'm not in the networking business. But there is, there is, there is an impact when, an, when a fragrance is released in the air. You know that because if you cook dried fish, there's an impact. <laughs> There is a tremendous impact on all your neighbors when you cook dried fish or shrimp or what do you call that? The pink shrimp. The binago. There is an impact when a fragrance is released in the air. And the word of God says that Jesus leads us into triumphant procession. Even though we're walking through the fire, through, through, through the flood, through the trials, we release and diffuse the oil and fragrance of the knowledge of his son. When you're walking through trials and you're praising the Lord, when you're being laid off and you're praising the Lord, when you have to go through over time mandatory and you're thanking the Lord that releases an oil of fragrance that people will ask what do you have in you it's not a secret I you didn't get that it's not secret (laughs) 
It's Jesus. And when you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, you release an aroma, a fragrance of the knowledge. It causes people to ask, and it causes people to know who Jesus is. So can we consider entering through any kind of trials with a triumphal entry, knowing that we are not orphans, we are children of God, and Christ is leading the way of this parade. I often say when we're in the middle of a crisis, we're on a parade. We're on a parade, Jesus. You're leading us. I don't know where we're going. I don't know the route of this parade, but you are leading us in this parade and you are leading us into triumph. And every step I take is a testimony I share. Come on. Thanks be to God who always leads us into triumph in Christ and diffuses the fragrance of his forgiveness, the fragrance of his peace, the fragrance of his unspeakable joy, the fragrance of his power and provision and his love. No greater love than this, that a man should die for his friends. The aroma of love of mercy and grace is what we release even in times of crisis as long as we are following Christ's leading. Amen. So consider how God never forgets his promises and intentions. Consider our need for a savior king. Consider how Jesus embraced his sufferings. And let us emulate, let us follow his lead. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love that knows no bounds. We thank you. We thank you, Jesus, that your love did not spare anything or anyone for us to be restored into relationship with you. And even right now, as we pray, I want to make sure I want to give opportunity to those who have not yet surrendered their lives to the Savior King, Jesus. If that's you today, I want you to raise your hand, whether you're on site or online. And just say, Father, here I am. I've been my own ruler. I may have called myself a believer. I may have called myself a Christian. But throughout my lifestyles, throughout my decisions, I've been my own ruler. And Jesus, today, this Palm Sunday, I recognize. Say it. I recognize my need for a Savior King. And I give my life to you. I surrender to your Lordship. I surrender to you the good, the bad, the ugly. My success, my failures, my sins, my own sense of righteousness. Surrender it to you, Jesus. Come be my king. Be my savior. I receive your forgiveness. I acknowledge that you died in my place. You took the punishment meant for me. And Jesus, I receive my salvation because of what you did on the cross. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace. Have your way in my life. Let your intentions be fulfilled in my life and around me. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen and amen. If that's you, 
If you just gave your life to Jesus, whether you're on site, if you're on site, please approach me if you gave your life to Jesus today. If you're online, you gave your life to Jesus. There's a connect card that our chat moderator is sharing um, right now. I want you to click on that link. We hope that message was a blessing to you. And if it was, feel free to share it on your social media platforms and bless your friends and family with it. And we also want to hear from you. So fill out the connect card that's found on the description box below and we'd love to connect with you. Also, follow us on Facebook at Champion Life Center Guelph to stay updated for the latest activities. Until next time, God, God bless. bless you.